Now, in my other video, I showed how we actually handle one of these density calculations, and we did it all by hand. Now, let's see how we could do something like this in Excel, just to make sure that we polish that skill in a little bit better. Uh, and for this, we can go ahead and we can use some absolute references, and we also have to do a lot of nesting on our parentheses, so this will be a nice practice problem. So if you want to try to follow along, go ahead and set up a spreadsheet that looks like this. You may not label it quite as thoroughly as this. You may just have M prime, DA, even if you don't worry about the subscript, DW, and then say the substance. Ooh, that shouldn't say DW. It should say D. There we are. And for the uh, values on this, if you're looking in the 8th edition of the textbook, this is the problem that you see on uh, page 35. So if you want to go ahead and give it a try, just to make sure you get the same result, go ahead and do that right now. Now go ahead and put in all these values into the spreadsheet so you're set to go as well. Remember, you really should be putting in these units. If you don't, I can't see you right now, so I guess I'll have to live with that. But you really should be putting in these units. Make it common practice. Even if it's just a practice problem, still put in units. It will save you very, very soon. Okay, so let's go ahead and we'd set up one of these. Let's determine the actual mass. There we are. So, we hit equals to tell it we're starting a calculation. We're going to be doing the top portion of a parenthesis, uh, of a fraction, so we need to put a parenthesis to open it. We can go ahead and start our whole part there. So 1 minus, we're going to have a nested parenthesis. We're going to have DA divided by DW. So there's DA divided by DW. Now, here's something I'm going to point out. If we're not going to copy and paste this down, and for what we're doing just here, we aren't. But if we were, and we want to make sure that these aren't going to slide, remember to do your absolute referencing. Now here's a nice little trick. If you want to just quickly toggle them, if you hit the F4 button, it'll just automatically put in those dollar signs, and it'll let you lock, unlock, unlock, lock everything, and just cycle through. You don't have to memorize the F4. That won't be an exam question, obviously, but it is a useful trick to know. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and have that up here on the top. Now notice, all I have right now is what's inside of the parentheses. I should have had this out front, but I'm still in the top portion of the fraction, so it's no problem. So I'll do times m prime, which is right there. I should also lock that one, so I'm going to use the F4 trick again. If you're typing it, just go ahead and type in those dollar signs. And if you're having trouble and you're trying to click in and you're having trouble with that, don't forget, you can always type up here in the bar and edit up here in the bar so that you're not accidentally clicking on other cells. Okay, so we've got all of that divided by, we're going to have to open a parenthesis for the bottom, 1 minus, we're going to need a new one to nest it, we're going to need DA, and I'm going to lock it, divided by D, and I'll lock it as well. So right now, nothing in this equation can move. Oops. Oh, I forgot to close my final parenthesis, but it's going to remind me to do that. I just look through and I see what's going on. See, I have two of them in the correction it proposes. I only had one there, and I remember, oh, right, I forgot to close it. And you can see that we got the same result as we did in that example problem that we did before. Now, of course, we should probably go ahead and fix our sig figs. Now, if this isn't a, treated as an exact number, then we only get two sig figs out of this, which means that there's no point in doing the calculation at all. The correction is so below the quality of our measurements that it's going to be meaningless. We're going to assume that these densities are well known, so we have at least three places, and in fact if the density of our substance is well known to be 1.33 exactly, then we'd actually have our four places, at which point there actually would be some sort of a measurable correction. But, let's see what going to happen if we were to vary dw. That's going to be pretty, pretty illustrative for us. So what we can do is we can just copy and paste this down. Now obviously it's not using this number at all right now. It's still just using these four numbers. Now here's a neat trick. If you hit F2 or you click up here into the formula bar, you'll notice that it highlights all of the bars, uh, all of the cells that it's referring to and matches it with the shading. Great way to refer to things. Now if our density of our substance is staying the same, but we're talking about what if we had calibrated with a different DW? We can just drag the DW lasso down there. Now the one thing I'd say then is I want to go ahead and unlock it. 
I've just completely unlocked it. I could have left it locked just to this column, but I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to go ahead and enter. So you can see that I'm going to be getting a more sizable correction if it's a really low density object like water uh, that we'd used as our original uh, calibration weight. If we just copy and paste that down, see I'm just dragging it down. There we are. And I can even go ahead and make this into a graph so that we have a nice, quick, intuitive way of seeing it. So I'll go ahead and I'll highlight the whole range. Here is one of the number one graphing issues that people have early on. So if you're going to go ahead and plot your data, oops, no. sorry, the new Excel takes me a second to find things. Here we are, insert a graph. People want to use a line graph. Let me show you why that's a terrible choice. Look at that. One is right up here against the axis. All these numbers aren't matching up. We can fix it so that it does, but we shouldn't have to. This isn't a good idea to use at all. What it's doing is it's treating all of these values as just being categories. So don't do that one. Always do the scatter plot in analytical chemistry. This isn't a scatter plot. Now, if you want the one that has the lines to guide your eyes, if you want the ones that smooth lines, eh, go for it, I guess, but these are the ones that we actually want. And I'll leave these red lines on so that we can see it really easily. You can see that as we change the density of our calibration mass, we have different apparent masses coming off. There's only one time where the apparent mass matches the actual mass dead on, and that's when we have that original calibration set. All right, now, Suppose we didn't want to do that for water. Let's go ahead and uh, for not for water. We, suppose we didn't want to do that for the density of the weight. Suppose that instead of varying dW, we vary the density of the substance. Now obviously I've got to go ahead and fix my locked cells again. So I'm going to let this one vary, and the other one I'm going to go ahead and lock in. This is a great way to play what if. Now I can just double click this and it'll automatically paste it down and you get the exact same sort of a sketch as you saw in your textbook right underneath that problem. And you can see that it's doing exactly what we would expect. Now, it's also kind of hard to see as we're looking at it and trying to let it guide our eyes. So what we can also do is we can go in here and uh, let's change our chart series type. Let's get rid of the dots and go for the curved line. Now that's more like what we're used to seeing in our textbook. So we can create the exact same sort of calculations just by quickly setting up an array of numbers, setting our formula up once, and then copy pasting down with only one of them unlocked. I just wanted to show you that as a quick example of using a bunch of different uh, actual uh, pieces of calculation and pieces of skills that we've seen to do something useful.